Good morning. Greetings to all of you and welcome again to Zion Lutheran Church. It's a joy to have you here in God's house this morning. And this morning the focus of our worship is the Reformation, particularly focusing on how God, using those reformers like Martin Luther, he gave the pure gospel back to the people. He, it was a refocusing on the truth that had been communicated since the beginning of time. And God brought that back uh, in full with those reformers. It's another reason to praise God this morning. With that in mind, we're going to open with our uh, opening hymn. It'll be sung uh, along with the choir. Uh, it'll be hymn 877. Note that the choir will sing stanzas 1 and 4, and the congregation will sing stanzas 2 and 3 along with the refrains and including the final refrain as well.
Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done. And we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our refuge and strength, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all their enemies. And bestow on the church your saving peace through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is from the book of Daniel, chapter 6, selected verses. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published... He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. 
So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. The word of the Lord. Be to God. And now we read Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear, he burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The word of our Lord. And now for our second reading. This section is from Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says is addressed to those who are under the law so that every mouth will be silenced and the whole world will be subject to God's judgment. For this reason, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by works of the law. For, through the law, we become aware of sin. But now, completely apart from the law, a righteousness from God has been made known. The law and the prophets testify to it. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all and over all who believe. In fact, there is no difference, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God publicly displayed as the atonement seat through faith in His blood. God did this to demonstrate His justice, since in His divine restraint He had left the sins that were committed earlier unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his justice at the present time so that he would be both just and the one who justifies the person who has faith in Jesus. What happens to boasting then? It has been eliminated. By what principle? By the principle of works? No, but by the principle of faith. For we conclude that a person is justified by faith without the works of the law. The word of the Lord. 
Now the choir will sing the following uh, hymn. Please note that the congregation will also join in for the final refrain.
Please rise for the words and works of our Savior. Our Gospel this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, beginning with verse 16. Jesus said, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Please again be seated for our hymn of the day, 863.
Dear fellow redeemed, it can happen with medical professionals that a patient doesn't make a great physician for themselves. You can understand why. It may be that a patient simply doesn't know what's going on. It may be that a patient denies what's really going on. They may brush off some of the symptoms and the warning signs and pretend like everything is fine. Now certainly this could happen in the, the medical field of, of physical health, but also when it comes to mental health. There may be all kinds of signs and warnings and they get brushed off. But the same is also true when it comes to spiritual health. We don't make the greatest physicians for ourselves. We're blind to our own issues. And we don't want to believe that not only do we have a problem, we are the problem. And so each of us in our own way is trying to pronounce ourselves innocent and guiltless when we know the truth is just the opposite. We know and fully understand that we are not perfect people. We steal. We cheat. We lie. We hurt. We rebel against parents, teachers, bosses, and others in authority. There are addictions there is violence. There are so many sins in so many ways. And any one of them may grip, may grip us. And so with all of this sin, we know that there's a real problem. We have guilt before God. And all the while, we're trying to justify ourselves, trying to make ourselves look good. But if we're fooling anybody... We're only fooling ourselves. Our can-do attitude then doesn't achieve its goal. The deception is that none of us is able to actually achieve that perfection. The deception is that we think we might be able to be perfect on our own. We think that if we just try a little harder or if we just do a little better, It'll be fine. But the truth is, we are condemned under God's law. God sees all of our faults, and He knows us even more intimately than we know ourselves. Our hearts are an open book to Him. He can read them so clearly. There's nothing that we could hide. And justice is served perfectly in His courtroom. We couldn't pull the wool over his eyes. We couldn't get around the truth, even if we had tried. He sees through the truth of it all. We can't talk our way out of what we deserve. And the law says that we deserve death. We deserve to be permanently cut off from all of God's blessings, including life and joy and peace and hope by God's law. Every mouth will be silenced, and the whole world will be subject to God's judgment. But let's pause there for a while, and let's first think about what happened 500 years ago at the time of the Reformation. This was a time where people's consciences were heavily burdened. They had sinful natures just like ours, acting out in so many different sinful ways, Their consciences plagued them, and they needed to find a way out. And so it was that some of those people decided to devote themselves to God 24-7. And they did it by going to a monastery or a nunnery. People would take vows of chastity and poverty, and they would vow to study God's word all the time. And so it was that Luther 
follow this same path. He had guilt on his conscience, and he wanted to clean that guilt away. He wanted that clear conscience. He wanted to find some kind of escape from the punishment that he anticipated with God. And so he entered the monastery as a monk. And if anybody could have had a clear conscience that way, if anybody could have been declared righteous, it would have been Martin Luther. Because he applied himself so devoutly to everything that he did. He learned to live a life of poverty. He learned to scrub those monastery floors. He spent hours a day in prayer and hours a day in worship. He spent time in seclusion. He kept himself behind those monastery walls, and the idea was to be away from the sins of the world and the temptations that, are, that were out there in the world, and instead to just be living a quiet life in seclusion. But even there, Luther didn't find the peace that he was looking for. Even there, the sins of his past still plagued him. Even there, the sins of all those good things that he didn't do, they plagued him. He knew that he wasn't a perfect person and that in some way everything he was doing was still stained with sin. And so he found no way out. Luther felt all the more terrified and trapped that God's verdict over him would be guilty. And it wouldn't matter on our own, even if we could keep part of God's law. Because again, God tells us very clearly in his law, we need to keep all of it and keep it perfectly. That means 24-7, 365 and for all 70, 80, or 100 years of your life. God demands perfection. We could think about God's law like a chain that holds us up connected to heaven. And as we hang on to that chain, we stay connected to heaven as long as we keep God's holy law. But we have to keep all of it. If even at one point, if even one single thing we do wrong, it's like one link in that chain that gets broken. And then in that case, the entire chain still fails. You fall down to death. We could also picture God's law like a canyon that we have to get across. There's no bridge, there's no rope. There's just you and a huge gap and a deep hole. And it doesn't make a difference if you can jump five feet or 10 or even 20. If you can't get all the way across, 100% of the way, that the result is still the same. You fall down all the way to the bottom. You die. And so again, if we cannot keep God's law perfectly and all the time, then we cannot be declared innocent by that holy law. It can only condemn us. None of us is perfect. Now, I know that in many ways, we are all so different. We're at different ages and stages of life. We have different styles. We favor different kinds of food. We have each our own families and friends and neighbors. You each have your own particular lines of work. You have so many different tastes and experiences, and it makes you unique. But then when we look on the inside, we see so much that is the same. And it is an unfortunate tragedy. We look inside at the human heart, and we see the same sins plague all of us. There is sin and temptation, and it comes from within us. The way we are brought naturally into this world, we come in without true fear of God and without true faith in God. We are unholy. We are sinful. And for all of this, 
God would be right to condemn us. Even the smallest thing is enough to condemn for eternity. Because even one sin is a serious thing in God's sight. It may seem like no big deal to us, but to God, each sin is worthy of an eternal punishment because it is a rebellion against what He has ordained. It is a rebellion against His commands. Yes, in fact, there is no difference because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so this all serves as evidence against us. Our guilty consciences, they tell the truth. We're plagued by that guilt. So when you finally meet your judge face to face, what will you plead? Innocent? Or will you come to God knowing that he already knows what you've done, knowing that he can already read your heart? and say, Lord, I'm guilty. But maybe not as guilty as the next person. That kind of excuse doesn't hold water in God's courtroom. It wouldn't hold in our own court system either. To say, yeah, I'm guilty, but the next guy's worse off. But it's even worse in God's courtroom because, again, even what we think might be a small deal is a huge deal to God. Even what we think of as, as just one small sin is still enough to earn a permanent sentence away from all of God's blessings. And at the end of it all, God treats us equally under His law. It equally condemns us all. There is no difference. We've all fallen short of his glory. God doesn't call us to compare ourselves with others. He, can, he calls us to compare ourselves with him and with his holiness, with his perfection. And maybe we also think, you know what, then I'm, I'm going to devote myself. I'm going to recommit here on out. From, from today forward, I'm going to do things right. I'm going to just improve little by little each day until I finally reach perfection. Dear Krishna, if that's the method you use, again, you will, you will come up wanting. Because we cannot reach perfection this side of heaven. There is always going to be that sinful human nature that wants to rebel and that will never trust in God. Moreover, even if we could reach perfection this side of heaven, we would still have those sins of our past still standing against us, and it would already be too much. Finally, that kind of thinking, it would be like going into our own court system and trying to, to, trying to squirm out of a fine by saying, Your Honor, I, I know what I did, and I know it was wrong, but, but there was all those other times where I didn't do anything wrong. You know, I went through that school zone 99 times, and I stayed under that limit. It was just that one time that I went over. The judge would then say, well, I didn't call you here for those 99 times that you did it right. I called you in to pay the fine for the time you broke the law. God would say the same in his courtroom as justice would be served. We can't say, I, I finally reached perfection and then ignore what's already happened in the past or ignore that sinful human nature that is part of each of us. Yes, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it is the road to death. Proverbs 14 tells us, And so you're there in that courtroom. The devil is there. He's accusing you of all these crimes. He is, he is trying to get anything and everything that he can to stick against you. 
And he only needs to have one charge actually stick. He's got a mountain of evidence. He's got all the testimony that he can gather. He's got notes. Maybe he even has video recordings. Then, of course, there's just the knowledge of God himself, who already knows your life inside and out. And Satan loves to then quote God's law and say, See, look. Look what they did. Look what they deserved. Give it to them. And with that mountain of evidence standing against you, you hang your head, knowing that you can't pull anything over on God. You're waiting for that dreadful sentence. You're waiting to hear those final words of judgment. The judge announces that he has reached a decision. You hear that gavel strike. Innocent. Not guilty. And there's a gasp in the courtroom. What? How could this be? How could this be? And the judge goes on to explain, yes, he knows the evidence, and, and yes, he knows what you've done, but he also knows you have the answer. Someone has already paid the price for you. Someone has already taken your place of punishment, and so you get to go free. In his name, and in his name alone, you get to walk out free of charge. All charges dropped. They've all been paid. Nothing sticks against you. How could this be? Could, could you go to the next slide? I'm sorry, my thing. Thank you. Uh, Romans 3.21 tells us, But now, completely apart from law, a righteousness from God has been made known. The law and the prophets testify to it. One prophet after another begins to speak the words of your pardon and release. They echo the words and promises of God himself. They tell about God's undeserved forgiveness and life and salvation, all in that promised Savior. We can flip through those Old Testament prophecies and look at who this Savior would be and what he would come to do. We could look at the New Testament and see how Jesus fulfilled every one of those prophecies. He made good on what God had promised. And in him, you have real life and real pardon. Jesus gives you the innocence that you so desperately need. His holy life was laid down as a sacrifice to pay for all of your sins. His death has now put you square with God's justice. And this Savior, this great defender, speaks on your behalf to God the Father continually, even as he holds out those nail-marked hands as the very proof of the reason for your release. And so God pronounces his verdict over you, innocent, not guilty. Could you go to the next one, too? Thanks. And again, Romans 3.21 tells us, that all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That word grace means undeserved love, undeserved favor. And it's related to the word that means gift. So I love when I see the word grace to think of God wrapping up a present and just tucking in all these beautiful priceless gifts of peace and joy and life and an eternal home in heaven and wrapping it all up with a present and a bow on top and saying, here, this is yours. And knowing that that gift is a true free gift, not something we've earned or deserved, just something that God freely gives. And because it's a gift, we don't have to worry, do I really deserve it? That's the whole point. You don't deserve it. That's why it's a gift but it's yours in Christ. And there's that word redemption. It's another beautiful word. And that word redemption means to buy something back. In the Old Testament, you could think about how people 
might have racked up a debt. And if the debt got too deep, eventually they might be hauled off into slavery and they might have to serve out their, their term. It could be a year's worth of slavery, five years, ten years, depending on how severe the debt was. And so they would work until such a time as they had worked that debt off. But if they had a relative that would come in and could pay that, that debt, if they could pay it in full, then they would say, let my relative go. And you could go free. This becomes the same kind of thing that Jesus does for us, but on a much grander scale. We had racked up a debt against us that was insurmountable. There was just apparently no bottom. No matter what we could try and fill that hole of debt up with, it never seemed to get us anywhere. All the good works that we would try to do would never avail. But Jesus paid that full debt. He paid that immense price of his holy, priceless blood and his innocent suffering and death. And so we get to go free in his name. Our debt has been cleared. We've been freed of all charges against us. There is nothing that now stands before, between you and God. You have been freely justified. Martin Luther said that when he finally understood this kind of free grace, he felt as if this heavy, weighty burden had been taken off his shoulders for the first time ever. It was a life-changing experience. He said he felt as if the gates of heaven itself had opened up and he could finally see a real way in. After so much trying and striving and knowing that he had come up short time and again and was never going to be enough on his own, finally he saw that in Christ and in him alone we have real hope. We have a real and sure way to heaven. It is simply a free gift from God, apart from God's law. And so then once Luther understood this, he committed the rest of his life to ringing out this clear message. Because in his day, there was so much confusion and misunderstanding. So many people were looking for peace, and they were trying harder and trying harder and trying harder, and they weren't finding that peace. They could never find it on their own. And so Luther rang out this clear truth of the gospel, free and full forgiveness in Christ and in him alone. He wrote about it in pamphlets and in books. He used visual arts. He used hymns, music. He used anything he could as often as he was able he preached and he taught this same message of freedom in Christ and in him alone. And by God's grace, God restored the true message of the gospel to the people through reformers like Luther. We are also the beneficiaries of that reformation. Hundreds of years later, we stand upon that same truth of freedom in Christ alone. And so today we celebrate that 500 years ago, Luther, along with those other reformers, they took a look at God's word, and they took a close look, and they saw the truth that was there the whole time, the truth of freedom in Christ, the truth of peace in his name, the truth of life because of his death, the truth about hope in his resurrection. Yes, today we can celebrate Luther along with those other reformers, and the grace of God that led them to that truth. Most, most importantly, we celebrate the gospel. We celebrate God's wonderful promises that are fulfilled in Jesus, and they give us sure hope and a sure way to get to heaven. It's a sure way to get a clean conscience, being washed in those waters of baptism, being cleansed by God's forgiving grace. And so today we appreciate Jesus, our Savior, and we rejoice over the verdict that he has announced. Innocent, all for the sake of his sacrifice. Amen.
Please rise. And now may that peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep and guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now confess our common faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and is in the kingdom of heaven. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Please now be seated for prayer. Gracious God, in mercy you sent your only Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, into this world to redeem us from sin and rescue us from hell. Through your scriptures and by your Spirit, you have brought us to faith in your Son and have assured us that Christ has fully completed the work of our salvation. Lead us to rejoice in the message of forgiveness through faith alone in Christ Jesus. When guilt grieves our consciences and shame squelches our confidence, use your word to encourage and comfort our souls with the good news of your unconditional love. Almighty God, in the face of immense pressure to compromise their confession, you emboldened Martin Luther and the Lutheran reformers to take a firm stand on the truths of Scripture. Through their clear confession of faith, you restored the gospel to your church and have preserved this saving truth among us today. Send us your Holy Spirit that we exhibit the same zeal and faithfulness as the Lutheran confessors. Give us courage to confess our faith sincerely and boldly in the classroom, the workplace, the community, and to everyone we encounter who needs to hear the truth of your word. Use our confession to bring faith in your Son to the hearts of those who do not yet believe in you. Eternal God, you have promised to preserve and protect your church in every age. Even when it appeared that the enemies of the gospel had silenced your truth, you kept your people faithful to you and your word. Bless all who face hardships for their faith with an added measure of your Holy Spirit, so that they do not lose heart as they bear their crosses. Comfort the sick and suffering, the depressed and lonely, those who are persecuted and ridiculed for their faith, and all others who need the encouragement of your love. Fix our eyes on the cross of your Son, his empty tomb, and the sure promise of eternal life in heaven's glory. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors, especially Don Paul, who went to his heavenly home this past week. Console those who are mourning or living with, with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Lord God, you know the concerns of our hearts and minds. 
Hear the public prayers we have spoken with our lips and the personal prayers we offer to you in our hearts and answer them according to your gracious will. Increase our trust in your power and wisdom that we may rest secure in the plans and purposes you have for our lives. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord. Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who in blessing his saints of the past has given us assurance and hope that following their example, we may run the race marked out for us and receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death 
all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it, you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please now be seated for our closing hymn, 855.
Greetings again to all of you in the name of Christ our Lord. I have a couple of things to highlight for you. The first is uh, a note that the flowers today uh, were given from Don Paul's funeral. And again, uh, please encourage the family as you have opportunity uh, with comfort that you have to offer. Uh, also, I wanted to remind you that at 3 o'clock this afternoon, there will be our ILS trunk retreat and chili crawl that will be here in our uh, parking lot and in the school building as well. Um, if you have the afternoon open, please consider coming by. Um, and <clears throat> um, there was one more. Oh, I have a letter I have to read as well. This is from Ann Adix. She writes, Dear ILS family, after prayerful consideration and discussion with my family, I have decided, decided to resign from my position at ILS at the end of the school year to pursue my master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. Since last summer, I have been taking graduate classes. Next school year, I'll be placed into an internship and expect to graduate with my degree in May of 2025. I've truly enjoyed my time at ILS. Thank you for allowing me the years to teach your children. I look forward to the blessings God will certainly provide in my new career path. Sincerely, Ann Adix. God's grace go with you throughout your week.